to recognize that these women standing at the front of the room are the students who've been fighting against this. They're in no way uh, representing administration or the decision makers who are going to eventually make this decision. So if there is any uh, uh, anger or any of those sorts of things, don't direct it to them because they're, they're working on behalf of the students, which is uh, unfortunately maybe not what everyone else is working on. Um, and uh, I can say all this now because I'm not running for any sort of re-election. <laughs> um, but, uh, but as a member of the, the Anishinaabe People's Council, uh, this came to us two years ago as a draft written by somebody who we had never met and were told that it had to be passed because it was a health and safety issue. And it had to be passed then, right? Uh, I called in from Ottawa and said, here are all, I just was able to, I only was able to read this once because I'm out of town, but here are the issues I found in the first read. Uh, and we were able to get it stopped, right? Um, in section three, I think it's section three, uh, I suggested two years ago, why would we, why, even, not even thinking about, you know, constitutional rights that are protected under section 35, but thinking about just efficiency, it makes more sense to have physical plant do one survey of the building one time and determine all the places that we can smudge and all the places that we can't rather than we'll, we'll assess it on each individual occasion. That doesn't make sense. That it, just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense from an efficiency standpoint. Right? Um, I still can't get any answers to what the last sentence under enforcement means, which means uh, which says repeated failure to comply with this policy may result in disciplinary action. I don't know what that means. Does that mean you're not going to get your credits? Does that mean you're not going to get your transcript? Does that mean you're not going to be able to... Uh, what, what does that mean, right? Disciplinary action, and I'm, and I'm just putting this out there, right? Disciplinary action without, like, the way law works is here's the law, if you break it, here's the consequence. Not, we'll determine the consequence later depending on how much we like you or not. That's not what enforcement means. Right? That's not how law works. Right? That's not how policy works. And if, and, if, and if after two years they still can't answer that question, that's a serious concern for me. Right? Because what happens when the next guy doesn't really, isn't really agreeable? Right? How does enforcement look then? Right? And as long as it's open-ended, that, that terrifies me. Right? Not because of what I think might happen, but what could possibly happen. Right? Um, I, I, I have to continue to object to the process of this whole thing. The fact that, like if anyone knows anything about duty to consult and accommodate, right? The Supreme Court decisions. The, if there is a, if there is a abri constitutional Aboriginal right that is to be infringed, it is, on the it is the duty of the person who is wishing to infringe that right to do all of the due diligence and all of the work in order to uh, justify that constitutional infringement. Uh, what the university has done is, well, we have, we have uh, I don't know, 180 employees or something here at the university. We're going to put it on seven volunteers who are students for them to negotiate this, right? And for them to uh, have to manage them, their, own, uh, their own students, right? Uh, which is a really uh, bizarre, and, and in, I would almost go to a, to a borderline abusive sort of situation, right? where it puts that responsibility on you folks uh, to have to uh, take responsibility for a policy that you didn't develop, right? Um, two years ago, we talked about this and said, well, you know, smudging is not the only, like, you know, I'm, I've got, uh, uh, I've got some form of asthma, my, my lungs are affected by those sorts of things as well. Um, but, Smudging is not the only thing that can affect somebody in this building. We've, we brought up the issue of perfume and cologne and all those sorts of things. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do, we'll, do, we'll do that. Two years has gone by, not even a draft of that policy. Not even a draft of the policy to deal with, with perfumes that are made out of chemicals, right? That are made out of chemicals that are not natural material from the earth, right? And I get really, I, I find it really offensive that somebody would hide their racism behind my asthma, right? Because that's what's happening, right? Um, the, the issue and the double standard of uh, we need to get notice. We have to get notice uh, if we are going to smudge. We have to get permission from somebody in administration. Um, but the cafeteria, about a month ago, can do steak day. Smokey's all hell in there, 
right? But it's state day. So I said, so, but, but it's, did you get permission? Did the fire department come? Did you have to shut everything down? There's smoke all the way out to the, to the fishbowl, right? Yeah. And uh, whatever that wing is, right? So where did all the smoke come from? Oh, it's steak day, right? So I gotta, I gotta, in my mind, the question comes up, is it that steaks are more popular than Anishinaabe people? Because maybe that's the case, right? Um, and so that sort of, uh, you know, that sort of double standard, right? Of, of we need a clear, concise policy to manage Anishinaabe people. We don't need a clear, concise policy to manage the corporation that has the means to do what they need to do, right? Um, we talk. They, there's all these concerns about a safe environment, right? Safe, and we have to make a safe environment. So my question then is, let's talk about mental mental safety, and let's talk about the the. So there there could be somebody who is uh, triggered by smoke. Or their asthma, or whatever that you know, whatever that thing could be. Uh, but think about the triggering effects of somebody who is in a senior administration rolling their eyes. Someone who is a security officer. I witnessed this myself. Security officer walk into our our closing feast and ask if we were smoking weed. Right? What's the mental safety that is that this university has just as much requirement to protect as somebody with a with a breathing issue? Again, like myself. Right? Because uh, that's the other thing. The university seems to have tried to take this moral high ground argument, right? That well, we're in favor of safety, and you're not, right? Uh, that's that's offensive. That's that's offensive, and it's nonsense, and it needs to stop. Because it this this uh, we're in a position of power. We're paid to do this. We're paid to manage you, and you're going to do what you're told. And that that history needs to stop repeating itself, right? Um, there has to be. I still don't. I still don't see in this policy anything about. They say internal communication, but what does internal communication mean? Because you gave three weeks notice last time, and we still have someone who is incredibly high placed in this building coming in here and yelling at us and rolling our eyes uh, during the opening of that ceremony to, me to commemorate those missing and murdered women. With three weeks notice, so I don't know what I don't know what two days does. I don't know what five days does. When three weeks, you can't even get it done, right? And what's the consequences, right? They, they, they talk about open-ended consequences. They're, we can disciplinary action, whatever we want to do to you, essentially, right? For anybody who practices their culture. But what's the response and what's the what's the disciplinary action for someone who is a paid, either faculty, administration, all those sorts of things, who then violates a student safety by those types of comments about, are you smoking weed in here? Uh, all those sorts of things. When the cafeteria, they knocked over a stack of uh, them little clamshells you put a hamburger in, knocked that onto the grill, the fire department got called. Our feast was was held respond, was was blamed for that. I had to go to administration and tell them. The fire the fire alarm was pulled in the other end of the building. Nobody came down and saw the smudge at the feast and walked to the end, walked past nine smoke, smoke alarms. To pull the one by the, by the cafeteria where there was actually a chemical fire, right? But they blamed it on us, right? So so all of those issues, um, and the fact that you have been left to deal with this, and the fact that people who are staff, administration, who are supposed to be there to work for Anishinaabe students, have left this to you, is it, it, it's it's infuriating. It's it's infuriating, and it's a, it's offensive. That, that this has been left to students to have to manage that and to have to deal with uh, the backlash from students, to have to deal with the emotional consequences of possibly re-triggering people in a former residential school, right? That all of that, um, and, the, and the fact that uh, two years later we still don't have a perfume policy, the, the whole thing about air quality is bullshit. That's it. Because if you haven't in two years been able to say, uh, here's our new policy on uh, clean air, then that's not really what it's about. And and so, I mean, that's that's just what I was able to fit on here. And I figured if I stopped at that, that'd be that'd be sufficient. Um, but I think if and I don't, I don't know where the other where the latest draft is because I, I heard that it was because it hasn't been passed by the board. But neither has this one, right? Don't let anybody tell you that this has been passed by the board of governors because it hasn't. 
so the the these are all big issues right and 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 it seems like the university says well we're we're concerned with health and safety but uh, then they have their, their 50th anniversary and they burn a bunch of oil barrels on the front lawn wow. uh, with which I can which all across campus you could smell the smell of that of that uh, starter fluid they use um, to me there needs to be a serious think about how this all came down and and you know I guess we could make our peace with this policy. I guess we could just learn to live with it. The way we learned to live with the treaties that weren't that didn't mean anything. The way we learned to live with the Constitution that didn't mean anything. The way we learned to live with, with residential schools that were a false promise. The way we learned to live with everything. But, you know, at some point, we gotta stop learning to live with it. And we gotta assert who we are, right? And we can't continue to give up and and uh, continue to, to just bow our heads uh, to those people who have decided that they know what's good for us uh, in our school, on our territory, right? Um, we can't continue to change our our culture, to change the way that we do things. Uh, and if we if we're going to do that, then, then you know maybe you know I don't know I don't know what would be better, the slow death, you know by a thousand cuts, I don't know. Um, but I think that those are the big issues that we need to think about. And if the university isn't prepared to think about uh, mental health, isn't prepared to deal with their staff, isn't prepared to deal with the people who create a hostile environment for students, then, you know, I don't know. So those are my comments. <laughs> You respect everybody's ways of life. So you have to speak to the people by saying, I'm respecting your ways, and I'm wishing if you don't want to take participate in this action that we're doing, could we get you to remove yourself from that building? Could you go back to your another building? Because we're going to do this because this is a traditional way of life. You have to inform the people that they're in the audience and saying, we respect your beliefs, but this is our beliefs to do this, because this is our way of life. That's what the physical plant is what when we were informed. They were supposed to send out a notice to all the students saying that there's going to be smudging in that section. And then if you're allergic or anything, then that's when they wouldn't go in that Area. That's what the. Can I just point out that the physical plant also is not here, right? Physical plant. The people and like the dean left. I understand the meeting went late, so maybe he had another meeting, and I'll I'll forgive him for that. But physical plant never showed up even once. I don't. I didn't see them here at all. Right. So again, it's on you. Right. Again, they're going to duck the meeting, and it's on you. Right. To answer this question. I think it has more to do with educating these people that are trying to uh, to. Uh, say no to this on, on the strength and the purpose of what it is that we're trying to do with this and, 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 and what the spiritual part of it means to the people. And uh, you know, a lot of times uh, those without knowledge yell the loudest. Those that are ignorant to things would rather stay ignorant to things so that they can yell the loudest. But once they become educated and they begin to understand, <coughs> these things don't seem as big as they are today. And, and why would you want to move backwards when you've got momentum going forward? That's all I, I guess. I've been to check something
explaining also to getting those MLAs that were elected, the mayor of this city, <coughs> sitting in on these kind of meetings so this way they get people's feedback and when it feels like to be pushed aside, there's a lot of good information was shared here today. The only thing I was going to add is uh, you people should uh, talk to the uh, group of them at the uh, Sioux College that got their smudging privileges more than they used to Because they brought it to the attention that uh, what smudging really detailed. And I think that had a lot to do with it. And of course, their elders are, are more active in, uh, in Chicago, so they are here, maybe because you have a bigger population. I don't know, but I know one thing. If they're gonna start taking away your right to smudge, then they're gonna take more rights away. And they'll keep on going and going. Right now, the push is on by provincial governments to stop the Indian movement because they're fearful that when it comes time to go to court to deal with the land thing, they're gonna lose even more than they did because we're getting stronger. We're getting more united. Instead of fighting amongst ourselves, we're starting to fight for our right. Smudging is not only for us, it's for the building and it's for the spirits that live in these buildings in the hallways. You know, I've been here at 2 o'clock in the morning with a few other elders, and we walked through the hall, and you could feel, feel the spirits in it, because the spirits were buried here. And to try to hide it, they built on top of them. They just want their rights to, to remain in peace. Smudging, the reason that's sent is to encourage the spirits to be restful, peaceful. Never mind what happened before. Try to overcome that. That's why smudging is. It's to give your spirit a time to relax. So you don't have to fight amongst other people. We got to be proud of who we are and where we come from. Nobody can take that away from you. They'll try to beat it out of you, like they did in the 50s and 60s. You know, three people couldn't gather together on a corner without being harassed. Are we going to go back to that? Because if if they start taking the work then, that's what's going to happen. This land is from the Garden River. It was given so that people will understand our culture and our history. Don't do what churches have done with that gift. Turn around, keep it a few years, and then sell it. Because if you give up your rights, and I'm not blaming you guys, but I'm just telling you guys, if you don't stand up for your right, you're going to lose it. So you guys, you guys meet once a week and then discuss things between you, what's happening to your situations that are happening here? Are you trying to like gather and sort of like that? Are you trying to say, well, what do you think about it? Can you give me some ideas? You know, what can we do? You know, like, like he's saying, talk about Sioux College. Don't you inform the people what smudging is about? I mean, what's What's it do for you as a personal thing? You know, like in that depth, I think that's your personal journey is going to be more powerful than what you're saying. Like with with this paperwork here that we see here, you're going to see it from your own heart. That's my own vote. So you can get more elders coming. Yeah, more elders of 20 and 30 years of experience in the 
and uh, they can give you a load of information to use, and they're not being utilized. <laughs> okay. The problem is, it's not them who's not using them. No, no, I don't. I'm just, I just want to remind you. Yeah. This would be extra in their pockets to help the cost. Yeah. You know, the more people you get, the more information you have, the more you can teach someone this information, the better off things can be. And it, and it stems right back to ignorance once again. Yeah. Um, my name is Deb, I'm an alumni of Columbia University. Uh, you guys are doing a really good job being intermediaries. I understand that's a difficult position to be in. But it's a really good learning experience at the same time. Um, I think uh, in your mind, sometimes you think policy is uh, finite. Once you create it, it's done, right? But I think uh, as a way of probably expanding and maybe making the building more inclusive, right? Because what they're essentially talking about, they're saying like, uh, the building has all these constraints on it, right? Fire, uh, perfume, allergies, etc. Right? You, can't, you can't really change that, right? Is there a way that you guys could um, lead to creating more spaces that are smudge friendly, if you will? Like retrofitting fans. If you could do some of that legwork now, it would be it'd be beneficial. And I know you guys leave your spots in SASA and some of you will graduate. But if you could do some of the legwork of costing out to what it would be like to retrofit, for example, maybe not the totality of it, but then you could think of creating future spaces that are more that are more smudge friendly, right? And that would be uh, a little bit of a legacy, but a little bit of legwork that your future SAS won't have to do. It's just an idea to keep it, to not think of it as finite, right? Even one one space a year, right? This year do this, then next year do that. Okay, so we have brought up that issue about creating more spaces that are more friendly. Um, <clears throat> because we did use uh, an example to the prayer room that's downstairs. Because in the beginning we had said that was also space for us to access as well. And we pretty much said, well no, it's been claimed by another culture practicing their traditions. We need something a little bit more inclusive for us within the institution because yes, we do have Sasa Lounge, but it's a lounge. It's not a safe space. Well, it is a safe space, but it's also inclusive to everybody, like regarding everybody else's cultures to come into the room and also learn about like, what we do. And they're like, we smudge in there with them, they ask questions, we answer. But we also, we're working on getting more of a private space for us to uh, smudge. Unless there's anyone else needs to say anything. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeremy Kula. I'm from uh, Mississauga. I came up here a month ago uh, just to kind of do some work here with my friend Trini and uh, we're buying a school up on Rankin Road. But anyway, at York University, uh, that's where I graduated for, for human resources management. So I'm a Classically trained human resources manager. I, my specialties are employment law and, human, and health and safety, right? Um, so from that standpoint, as a health and safety um, graduate and health and safety uh, rep, uh, I can tell you a couple of things. First of all, you would be doing more harm to health and safety by not smudging than you would be with smudging. A couple of reasons. First of all, sage, for example, uh, when it's dispersed into the air, actually removes about almost 100% of bacteria and viruses from the air, and it lasts about three months. Nikola Tesla did this before any of his uh, workshops uh, went into production. Um, so that does a couple of things. First of all, anyone who has asthma or suffering from bronchitis or any kind of respiratory diseases, uh, it actually reduces their irritation from that because there's not that much stuff in the air that will irritate them. Now, yes, the smoke is going to irritate them or anything like that, but sage especially dissipates very quickly. So they may cough once or twice, but that's about it. Uh, second of all, there's the emotional and psychological factor. When you don't allow someone to smudge, and this one I think is a little more important, when you don't allow someone to smudge, uh, you're taking away their, what I would say, fundamental human right to be in a uh, healthy state of mind. Right? When they don't have that, you're not only risking their safety, but also the safety of everyone else in the community. Right? Because you don't know how much they might respond and stuff like that. So I've experienced that at York University and they have a very good policy with smudging there. 
uh, and they had to fight for it. And with York University, everyone knows that it's like, you know, protest central. <laughs> so even the smallest thing, what, you're out of muffins? All right, I'm going to block the roads, let's go. <laughs> All right, so when they had the smudging thing there, and they have a very good Native American program now, but when they had the problem with, this, with the smudging there, uh, it wasn't even an issue. The, the administration knew that if they were to even mention any of this, they'd be shut down faster than the wind, right? Um, so, and you know, and we, we call the uh, York administration the Red Army <laughs> because their colors are red, but yeah. But I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, so like I said, it's a health and safety issue, but you'd be doing more harm by not allowing it than you would be allowing it. And uh, it's, it's a question from there. As far as retrofitting the building, I think Mitch had a very good point for that. Uh, just doing it as a, as a progressive thing from year to year. And we're willing to help you with that. Shanini and myself, we know a lot of people that do retrofitting. And uh, I know electricians and, and uh, you know, vent guys and AC guys. So that's not a problem. We'll even do a pro bono, right? I mean, we got the school up on Rankin Road. We're converting that to a green school, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I have all the faith in the world with you guys, and I'm sure you'll be able to follow through. But the thing is, you have a legacy to protect. And at the very least, at the very bottom least, this is still native land. And it doesn't matter how many people come here from anywhere, right? As far as I'm concerned, if you don't even know your own culture and your own heritage, how can you even have the gall or the cojones, right, to even consider questioning someone else's? Like that's the highest form of ignorance that I know. But anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just uh, want to point out too that uh, not only on the, the time commitment of these folks here uh, and this, the volunteer student association, but I, uh, who paid for the coffee? Sounds uh, fascinating. So now the students are paying out of pocket now, out of our funding, to implement the university, to have to coordinate and defend this university's policy or whatever, or be in that middle ground or whatever. Right? So, you know, Curious. that. I'm, I'm so glad my career as a SASA rep is done. <laughs> I'm sure the administration is glad too, but uh, <coughs> that's, that's maddening to me that they want to pass this policy and then they pass, they, they pass the time commitment onto you, they pass the responsibility onto you, and they pass the financial commitment onto you. That's maddening to me. Being this my grandfather's school, is there a way I can get into the court system or to these people myself and fight for this cause on my own terms? Chief Shanewalk was his grandfather, right? Um, for me, it's very powerful that we have community out today that cares about our students. And I'm sorry I might cry. It's very emotional for me that um, that we're not here by ourselves fighting this. No, and I think admin would probably be surprised to know how important this is. And I, I think that's the disconnect for them, right? They don't know that it's important. They don't understand that part of it. And so as a frontline worker working with students, I'm always worried about their safety because any student that comes to university um, carries some trauma with them before they start their education. So to walk in these doors and face those demons and, and come to try to get an education 
uh, they go through an emotional rigmarole. Like it's very emotional for students in general, but Anishinaabe students, because that's who I work with, specifically. And so to deny us an opportunity to have one of our healing components um, denied or confined in some way is very frustrating. And I appreciate um, your, your love and your support here. Um, I'm overwhelmed by people showing up today and it makes me very happy. Um, for staff persons like myself, we are in that awkward position of being that liaison between students, community, and admin, and our board of governors. And like I've talked to probably every student here about, we have to live in both worlds. And I have to be able to come here and speak with you in the community and hear your concerns and feel your love and your care and concern for us. But I also have to go and talk to admin. <clears throat> and I have to be able to, in their speak, in, in English, in policy terms, in ways that they would understand, um, talk about how we fit with that. And so in any situation and in any relationship, there's compromise that has to be made. And we are not willing to, to accept how it is right now. And that's why you being here gives us power. It gives us strength. Um, and so I appreciate you being here from the bottom of my heart of every single one of you to travel out today to come and be on our campus is beautiful. And I appreciate that. But they don't they don't like to be seen. They like to stay behind them. This room would have been over full, but a lot of the people that I talked to said they already made the decision. They just haven't told you that they made it yet. And that's that's the problem with a lot of things. Because I talked to a lot of the students that found out that they were Nishnabi because when they were growing up as kids, they were always, you cut their hair and do this and you follow her and you act like her and you be like her. And today the administration is telling you the same thing. Act like these people. Well, sorry, we're different. Because I don't know about you, when I walk or I talk, my ancestors are with me. I'm told that whatever my actions is, if it's not good, my ancestors pay for it in the afterworld. And white people don't understand that. They don't understand, well, how, how come you talk about it in the family? You know, I got my uncles, but I don't know anybody else. Remember when you were kids, if you're older, we used to go door to door in our community and they'd say, who is your father? Who is your grandfather? Who is his father? And you used to have to go back seven generations. Mm -hmm. Today you can walk on the reserve and you can say, who's your dad? Uh, his name is Roger, I don't know his last name. I go, oh, okay. Who's your mother? Oh, Diane. Well, who's her mother? I don't know. I said, well, is it time to find out? We lost a lot of things. Please keep trying because I know it's not your fault. But if, if, if you let the community come to back you, this room will get over full. What happens to you when you practice more of it? Do they give you a charge? Are you going to give you no more diploma? Are you not going to get your marks or something like that? Is that going to happen to you if you start doing more of it? I got to be doing more of it. If they're going to give me, send me out of here. I missed here for a couple of years here. I'm going to create lots of havoc here. I think it's more so of just finding the students. I think that's what that's about. So we're not doing more of it. So I don't know what that means. Uh, because if they want to take my diploma away, then so be it. Take it away, I'll go grab my education somewhere else. But, you know. The administration and the counties, they know that they're their guests here on our land. Guests and only guests. And with this type of nonsense, taking our rightful uh, prayers and our, our in my home where my people have died to, to defend this country and, and for what you guys have now, to, to be able to use this school as that, 
people need to just remember that they're just guests here. They don't own anything. And us as a First Nations people, if we walk there to any Crown Court right now and say, we want our gold back, we want our money back, we want all our lands back as a people, they lose. There's nothing they can do about it. Yes. Well, she had her hand mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Did administration, anyone from administration uh, get invited to come here? Did they know, yes, are they aware of it? Yes, mass email. You sent them mass email? Of, uh, to the, the faculty. So I think this law is bogus then, if they can't even show up to, to hear <coughs> their own rights. Stand in front of a crowd and say, well, this is our policy that we're trying to put forward. Yeah, that's it doesn't say a whole lot, does it, when the they're not even here. Does, is anyone on the administration actually, like are there natives on the administration? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can we get rid of the floor, please? Sorry. Yeah. 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 My name is Judy Surratt, and uh, I'm the director of the Nishkanti Division. I'm administration. I'm one that's here, and um, I'm very proud of these six young women who have taken this forward because it was it was out there and it, nothing happened and this year they took it forward and so I'd like to give them a chance. <laughs> I've been here in Algoma for 25 years and I started here back in 1987 and I was the first Anishinaabe Quay here uh, working in this environment and um, at the time there were only a handful of students here they were, and most of them were part-time. Um, once, the, and it was the community who initiated the position <coughs> here in Oklahoma, and they initiated initiated a position, Native Student Counselor, up at Sioux College as well, because they needed to see their students succeed here at the university in post-secondary education, and that wasn't happening. So they needed somebody within the environment to help those students feel comfortable, to be able to navigate, to know what. A degree was or a diploma to be able to to uh, have someone to go and talk to if they were having difficulties and so that's how it started way back actually in 1986 I was the second native counselor here at Algoma and I started in February of 1987 so we've come a long way and at no time in all those years since 1987 were we told we could not smudge here? We were never told that. So I, I, there seems to be misin misinformation in the community that we're told we're not able to smudge. We are able to smudge here. And I think that's really important. The thing that we need to, you know, we smudged in here this morning. We didn't ask permission to do that. We just went ahead and smudged it. There's some places where, where we can't, where there's... Where we ask for permission to. Pardon me? The First Nations people, who do we need to ask permission to? We're in a public building. That's the one thing we have to understand. Public building owned by who? The town? It, 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 it's owned by Alabama University. Who owns Alabama University? I, I'm not here to argue with you. I just want to just set the record straight that, you know, we are in a public building. We share it, we share this building, this is ours, and this is a cross-cultural institution now. We call it a cross-cultural institution. We have a lot that we need to, we have a lot of work we still need to do, believe me, we do have a lot of work. And what we're, right now, uh, we have a new president who's looking at wanting to indigenize the, the academy. What does that mean? We're probably going to be having community meetings about that. Having inviting people from the community to come in and talk about exactly what that means. But I think we've come a long way. We have come a long way. We have a lot of students here now. We have a lot of graduates every year. And our graduates are going on to, uh, you know, to uh, graduate programs, PhD programs. Uh, Deb is one. She's just completing. Uh, Patty Massage she's completed. Her masters. So we're getting a lot of our students who are going on. And I think our students that are here are learning how to 
uh, take their place in society, how to, how to uh, negotiate, how to uh, speak up, how to uh, find out what they need to know to, to move things forward. And, and I attended a meeting that, uh, that the students called with the, the fire chief and the fire marshal. And I was really impressed with what, how they conducted themselves and the questions they were asking. This college is we're, like we're, respons college, right? we're responsible here. <coughs> I'm in part of admin, but I'm responsible for the, for the safety of everybody in this field, in this institution that attends here. And I think, you know, we have to, and we, we do have to have a place this much. I agree with that. We have to have our own place. I've attended, I've visited other campuses where they had their own uh, building where they could smudge, they could help hold circles and, and whatever. And that's one of the things that we need to do. We need to come together and say, you know, this is what we would like to see. I know that some of the, uh, Muslim students have a, a prayer place, but we would like to have our own place where we could do the smudging. The Sasa Lounge is one place, yes it is, but it isn't a private, it isn't private for anybody who wants to maybe go there and have a smudge because maybe they uh, are not having a good day or whatever the case may be, but it is there available for them. We need to work to look at, okay, this smudging policy is just one thing but it doesn't define who we are and it doesn't define what we can do here. And I think that's the important piece that we have to remember. The students, we can come together as a group. There's admin, there's faculty, there's staff, there's students, that we are all interested in, in making this place uh, a really good place for our Anishinaabe students. What started all this epidemic in a sense? What started this? Like, Health and safety legislation. Is this a I I I'm not even going to go there. All I'm telling you is that it's legislation that we are all have to operate under as public institutions. And I don't think that, uh, like I said, there has never been uh, enough. We were never told that we could not so much. I think we were just asked for. Uh, uh, notification in particular areas. Mm. But when so, you were sitting at that meeting there, did you have to have a stomach turnover like that? Like an undiscomfort when you were kind of like against like what they were doing? And you've been here that long? Did you have like a turmoil going on with yourself? Because we have a smudge there. That's what I'm saying. Like, when, you, and, when and they bought that policy, you said, well, I'll come to bring this policy. I've been here for this much. You should have stood up and said, "Hey, I, I'm going to stand up here now. I have, I'm an elder here now. I got to say something. <laughs> My stomach is turning here just listening to you." Well, if I was here, I'm going to be standing up in the front line. Sir, <laughs> My stomach is turning the way you're addressing our elder. Okay. All right. There's no need for such disrespect. Yeah. <clears throat> Finally, there are men here standing up for the women. Okay. The women have been on the front line for a long time. Okay? And we have an elder. And the need to be respected as elders. Okay. okay? We have things to say. We say them in a respectful way. We don't attack people. These are our people. And we need to respect that. They are here to help us do the best they can, and they are open to suggestions, but we're not here to attack one another. We're not here to try and force something. We're here to talk about something. In a peaceful manner, this is why this is going on. A gentleness, the sacredness of the woman, and the support of man. <coughs> is most important in this culture. They've asked many a time. We would like to see the men come and support us. So when you look around, we're starting to come and support them. So support them. So I just would like to finish to say that this policy was brought to the Anishinaabe People's Council, who has been an advisory committee here 
community-based advisory committee here at Algoma since 1986. It started off as the Aboriginal Education Committee, and it has changed into Anishinaabe, and it's representative of uh, uh, the First Nations, uh, the Métis community. Um, students are, are sitting on this. Um, I'm just trying to think you all. Uh, there's also administration on there, but the voting members on that committee are Anishinaabe people. It was also brought to the Elders Council. And the Elders Council looked at it and they discussed it at a meeting, and they thought that the health and safety of everyone was sufficient, and they approved it, and it was brought back to the Anishinaabe People's Council. That's where it sits, that's where the, the policy sits, waiting for a response from the students, because the student did say at, the, uh, at one of our meetings they wanted to bring it back to the students, and the uh, ATC has been waiting for a response from the students. So it hasn't been approved anywhere. It has been brought to ABC. It's brought back to the students, and the students are going to bring it back uh, to the next ABC meeting or forward it to me that I will take it forward to on their behalf to ABC, which will be uh, the next meeting is May 18th. Yeah. Okay, so one minute. We have just under an hour until we have to add because there's another event going on after us. So. I booked it for as long as uh, I could for everybody to talk as well. So just so you know, we have under an hour. So we'll go with Mitch first, and then we'll, oh wait, you first, Mitch, yeah. and then yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, my name is Dee Shanger. Uh, I'm a live streamer from Toronto, and I was invited here by Elder Emerson. And there is a worldwide wa audience watching now. And traditionally, between live audience and archival views, there'll be four or five continents watching this. And I know from the live chat, uh, the world has two main questions as to what's going on here. And one, this encroaches on religious freedoms. Traditionally, there's separation of church and state. I don't think any university would institute a policy that a Christian priest can't use their frankincense incense, you know, because that's separation of church and state. Well, what's the difference here? That's the one concern that I'm reading from the live chat. And two, this is a site of a residential school. And we all know how ugly a period of time that is. And if this administration was serious, about any making amends, but this is a slap in the face of the history of this site. And I just, you know, I've been invited on many First Nations territories to live stream by many elders and grandmothers, and a lot of them call me the digital shaman. So I'm just trying to say to you what the world watching this is saying. Thank you. And at least someone from the administration is here, but I think it's despicable. Thank you. I, I just, I have to go back to, um, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, because this has been going on for two years. Right? Uh, and uh, I'm gonna try not to uh, be offended by some of the comments that have been made. Uh, that, that, that SAS has been working on this for two years. Uh, and, you know, a APC is, uh, is ostensibly representative of the community, but also I, re I recall uh, two years ago uh, when uh, Batch 1 of First Nation appointed their representative, the university refused to accept it because it wasn't under their format because, and I was told this in the APC meeting, that this is not the community's council. This is a council of the board of governors of the university. That's what I was told. So, so I, I, I don't really know how representative APC is of that. And, I, and that's not a slight against APC because I, I know those people. I've sat as a member of APC. I'm currently a member of APC, and they're incredibly well-intentioned, good-meaning people who care about our students. My my concern is about the structure the university has placed them in in that they will not accept a letter from Batch 1 Achievement Council as, the, as, as a uh, uh, 
sufficient enough for them to accept their representative because it's not the community's council. It is a council of the Board of Governors, right? A committee of the Board of Governors, rather. So, so I don't know how representative that really is, right? But my other concern is, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm struggling now because I, I, uh, I want to remain polite and respectful. Um, but with all due respect, again, uh, administration is saying health and safety. And, and we've been saying for two years, what about mental health and safety? And there, no response, no response. What, show me what the administration has done about that concern, right? Like, especially when you look at the Board of Governors just passed the, res or, not Board of Governors, the Senate just passed the resolution in I believe it was uh, December to extend, uh, to create a, a spring, winter semester, what is winter, like January, is that winter semester? A winter semester reading week, no. Fall. fall semester reading week because we had one in the winter, we didn't have one in the fall. And part of the rationale for that is because the suicide rates of student, university students is ridiculously high across the province, right? And, and, and we've been saying this, I, again, we've been put in position of health and safety. You're either for health and safety or you're not. We've been talking about mental health and safety, which is just as, just as if not more serious concern. And I have seen no response from the administration on that. I have seen no response from APC on that. I have seen no response from, with all due respect, the Anishinaabe initiatives on that. And, 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 and then we're told health and safety. If you're against this policy, it's health and safety because it's a public institution. With all due respect, we've been saying for two years, what about mental health and safety? No response. I don't, I just don't know how like I, I'm trying to, re I'm trying to remain uh, calm, cool, and collected about this, but it seems like we, we say all of our concerns, and then the university says, anyway, health and safety. Here's your policy, right? Here's your policy. Take it or leave it, I guess, or whatever, right? And I don't know how. Like I don't know. I don't know how students, like I've been, I've been a, a student, I was a student here, and now I work at the partner institution at Shinguaku and Magegamek. I was on student, student association. I, I worked with this, the student union. I was on Senate, I was on Board of Governors, I was on APC, I was on several committees for the board, for the Senate. With all, like, trying not to not be humble here, but like I have a pretty good understanding of the working of the institution, right? Like that training that, that, that Judy was rightfully talking about, that training that you're getting, I got that training. I understand how this institution works and I still can't get any answers to my questions I've been asking for two years. So how does Joe student or Jill student say get answers to their questions? If with my six years of experience, seven, seven years now of experience working in the building in different capacities, and my understanding of the system, if I can't get answers, how then does student get answers without that experience, right? And, and, and I'm sure the response will be health and safety because we're, we're apparently against health and safety, right? And that's an, unfair, that's an unfair position to put the students in. And it's an unfair position to put the community in, right? And, and then I like, you know, I don't know what the consequences will be now for me, having said all this. Uh, but I already got my degree. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the consequences will be, right? But I know. <laughs> I don't know what the consequences will be now. But uh, I feel like that I can say this now. Uh, I never was that. I never was that. Uh, what do they call that? Subdued when I was a student. Uh, but there was always this, this uh, hesitancy to say something because we well, don't know what the consequences will be. Uh, I don't care about the consequences anymore. But I, I just want to know how are we going to get answers to those things? Because we've been saying it for two years. What about mental health and safety? And all those other issues, right? And the double standard of the cafeteria having one rule and us having another. The double standard of the perfume and cologne and all that sort of stuff, and then us. 
Health and safety is a bullshit argument. worship leader in the United Church of Canada. If I understand correctly, smudging is the way that encourages the centering of a person, the, um, the collective wisdom of the ancestors that are brought forward, um, and it's to invite prayer to Creator. If I was going to school here, and I did take a semester here a long time ago. And someone had, sh and someone said to me that I couldn't find a quiet space and start um, to pray. <clears throat> I would find that a, an infringement on my basic human right to do that. If I was a person of Muslim faith and I wanted to take that time and, and drop somewhere and face Mecca, wherever I was, and someone said I couldn't do that, that would be an infringement on my human right. <coughs> I do believe that this issue goes straight to the human rights issue. I don't think that someone needs to give permission. That's my own personal opinion. I'm not stating that as anything but myself, Lynn. I think that a person, if they decide that, that this, if they wanted to have a smudge in here or they wanted to smudge in the student lounge or they wanted to smudge in their dorm room, dorm room to invite that ceremonial space and uh, to create that quiet center, that that person should be able to do that because it's part of their basic human right to be able to do that. I don't, I don't ask for two hours in advance notice if I want to pray. I don't think that people should have to do that. That's my personal opinion. I do understand that it is a, big, a bigger issue. But I think when you, come, when, it, when you distill it right down to the very essence of it, it's an infringement on a basic human right to do something that is about health and well-being, emotional health and well-being, spiritual health and well-being, which is paramount to the success of a student, the success of the institution. That's <coughs> 
person in the community. I want to commend you people for doing the things that administration should have been doing, but maybe figured that it was beneath them. You know, a lot of people have fancy words for a lot of things. But well, let's get down to the real nitty gritty. You want to stop the momentum of First Nations gathering all together. Before, the government used to always say, what about the Ojibwe over here? They're trying to take over your pot. And the natives were always fighting with each other. Because as long as we're fighting, we're not going to stand up for something. One of the things is, it's most important, is if they want to change the smudging thing, build us a, a place that we can come together as one. You want to stop us from smudging there? Build us a building. Let us do what we have to do. That solves everybody's problem. You want to stop us? Here, build this. It's our property, build it right here. So we have access to it. And if somebody talks against that, <coughs> ask them, where, where, are they, where are they centered? I know it's an expense, but so is the expense of giving up a right. It's not a privilege. At one time, you know, in Ontario, you weren't allowed to smudge in a, in a uh, funeral parlor. But today you're allowed anywhere there's a funeral parlor, you're allowed to smudge, you're allowed to drum. Because the government understood what smudging was really all about. But it's like one thing, if they take one thing away from you, then it's much easier to take everything else away from you without you really seeing it. When I was stationed in Cyprus for six months, they were doing things in our barracks that we didn't approve of, but it was their territory, and they said, either you like it or move the heck out. So what do you do? Here we say, no, we'll stop doing what we're doing to accommodate you. If it's health and safety, then they have to stop the use of perfumes. Because if you notice, there's notices in certain public buildings, non-perfume areas. Because people are more allergic to that than they are smudging. And smudging, you can use less smoke or you can have lots of smoke. But you can almost add no smoke. All you have to do is add cedar and sweet grass. Anyway, I think you ladies have done a remarkable job just putting up with guys like me. <laughs> Word has a lot to do with the, um, it, that's in, in this policy as of right now. Um, it could not say like, Together, working with the director of physical plan, you we request you to, in writing, to have you know five days. But they put it in a way that it's almost like offensive to me. Like you have to write us five days in advance. And you have to have written permission. We have always been told ever since the beginning of time what to do. You know, and um, this policy, I can. I can almost agree with it, but that wording could change, and the enforcement could change. Um, it, the enforcement has to be clear. Um, the wording has everything to do with you can call me an Indian or a fucking Indian. What do you take offense of? You, of course, you take offense to uh, swear before the Indian. It's how you say things to each other that you may feel offended. I feel offended the way this is written. They can change the writing and make it like work together, you know, with physical plan. That's, that's, that's my opinion. It's just the wording feels, seems kind of like one-sided, like they don't want to have nothing to do with it. It's just like you have to have a permission, you know? So, something like that.
has to be done on the word. the best. Um, I know in your hearts what you know to be right and I know that uh, you're going to try to do the best you can for all those concerned and uh, like once again I say even the ones that are in the uh, living on campus and around campus uh, it must be difficult at times uh, when the day is done to be able to say ah, the homework's done Everything's done, and most of the time it's like one, two, three o'clock in the morning, and you got to get back up and do it all over again. And, and just to wash that all off, you know, to do that bit of a smudge. And most of these medicines, they're medicinal. All these medicines, the four main medicines, they're all medicinal. They're, they're, they're there more to help you than hinder you or to hurt you. And it's been proven. I mean, even the uh, sage itself. You have sinus conditions or you have headaches, it takes it away. You know? It's put in it, it's it's a part of four different medicines that they put in a small pillow and put inside your pillow if you have asthma to help re remove it. You know? It's 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 just mind boggling where where they're coming from and, and the uh, the they don't have the knowledge uh, you know, go to, go to the medicine people that use these medicines. Ask them about them. Tell them, let them see the results on, on what the, the medicines actually do to help people. You know, it, it, I've heard all of what it does that is supposed to harm people, but nobody has said anything about what it does to help people. I mean, that's what I mean uh, for ignorance. And I brought that up at the beginning of the, the those that are ignorant want to stay ignorant. They don't want to hear the healthy things that come along with this stuff. And they haven't looked into these things to find out the benefits that come along with this. It's only what a few are saying are no good to them. And, and Mitch has put out a, many a good uh, thing there where he said about, you know, steak night and uh, chemicals on the spilled over. And, you know, I imagine there's been a lot of times they've had to tar the roofs and they haven't told the, uh, and no notified everybody in uh, two weeks in advance that they're going to uh, tar the roof and that if anybody's got any problems with asthma that might be bothered by this tarring the roof, you know, that, and, and how many times that they went and they painted the, the uh, parking lots and I imagine they didn't do anything about that either. And, Paint fumes, I have a mother that paint fumes just drive her nuts, you know? And what about the art rooms? Do they have proper ventilation? If so, when they're bringing the art stuff out, is it all dry and uh, free of chemical when it goes across through the, through the uh, univer university, college? You know, there's, there's, there's so many carcinogens and, and, and that to think that sage is a carcinogen, I, I worked in a place where we work with steel and, and we've got asbestos in, the, in there. We have fiberglass that's it's coming off the sand that's being burned in there. Wear a respirator. If someone has a problem, wear a respirator. Wear a paper cup. There's lots of places if there, you know, there's emissions, car emissions. Look at the size of that parking lot. When all the students are here, how many car emissions do you think come out of there first thing in the morning and last thing at night? You know? And they're all carcinogens. You know? It, it seems uh, awful strange to me. And yes, I was a health and safety rep too in Algoma Steel. And, uh, you know, policies are made to be changed, to be worked with, to be worked on to fit the environment. And, and there are legislative things that say 
you are allowed so many decibels or whatever it is being sound that you're allowed to put out for the people around. Same with carcinogens, there's so many that can be put out healthy in a safe way for eight hours or 12 hours. Get reports on this kind of stuff and, and, and see if they, they can give you some leverage in, in where you're going with your stuff. Maybe it may help, I don't know. I just wish you all the best and I know you're in a very tough spot and I, and I commend you, I say thank you very much. Oh, say a couple of words. Who was there? I'd just like to uh, thank my young friend here, Mitch. I started jumping around when he was 17, and uh, I had the other smoke, and he's still alive, so there's proof that smoke doesn't bother you. He had asthma or something, but he had his window all the time. Every place we traveled, he had the window open. <laughs> when I first heard about this, uh, Well, I was the mildest person in the world. I said, I'm going to show them guys that you better have smudging in Alabama University. And I started thinking, there's got to be some other people in here that's uh, like these girls. So I said, I have to listen to their uh, story first. But when I first heard about it, I think one of them asked me, who told you about it? And I wouldn't tell them who, so it was you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was mad. And I settled down. I said, I'll go and see them first and find out what their uh, issues are. And when I first heard there was no sponging going to be allowed, and I'll go with you, man. Suddenly, I only got grade three because I would have did something really, really fantastic for you. If I had more education, I'd probably be the president of the United States. So that's why I created you not to educate me. <laughs> Stay the way you are, you dumb Indian. That's what I say. <laughs> But uh, I feel we're really uh, happy we we're here to give you a hand if we get anything good. You're welcome to use it. And you showed us a lot of good. And uh, when you're an organizer and you bring the right people, you don't want to have to say a word. It <laughs> just carries them on. <laughs> so you're doing a good job. All these. Thanks. So, just my last. I won't say that because that might not be my last. But um, if you if you notice, I mean, I had a pretty long speech here. Uh, only two of the things I said were actual issues with the way the policy is. Right? The rest of my concerns and the concerns I've been saying for two years now are about process, about the process that this went through and the process that it continues to go through. And all of those things. And so this is a question that I don't even know if you, like I know this, you can't answer this question. But I'm going to say it. So what is the next, what's the next step? Not necessarily in relation to this policy, whatever, right? But what, like, I, I want to, I would, I want to see some sort of commitment from administration to say we're going to start to address those issues, right? Uh, and I know, and I'm sure that what's going to happen is, uh, oh, that's just Mitch, he's just crazy, then just ignore him, <laughs> right? But I've been saying this since last year when I was elected with like 94% of the student vote, right? I was saying this last year when I was representing the student association and had the total support of the, to of the student, of the council, right? So, so it, it, I mean, if you want to ignore me now, fine. But these are issues that were put on record uh, when I had a mandate to say that. <laughs> and, and I want to know what what is administration going to do to start to fix the process issues, the process problems of they developed it without telling anybody, it brought it to APC, who are often told, well, you can't really bring this back to the community because these are confidential things and those sorts of things. And there's always ambiguity about what we can share and what we can't and when it's going to be an issue and when it's not. And so people err on the side of caution. Uh, and then uh, the, all of the burden being put on students to negotiate it, uh, the issues of the double standard. What's the administration going to do about that? Because I don't. And I know you can't answer that, and I know, I mean, you know, Judy might not even be able to answer that because that might be the president or whoever, I don't know, right? And, I, and I'm, 
through this whole process, I've been trying to not uh, be accusatory uh, and trying to continue to maintain respectful relationships. But at some point, it's like, well, how, what is the administration going to do about these other concerns? Because it just seems like we'll just ignore it until it goes away. Uh, and, and I have a real issue with that, right? So wherever, whoever's still doing the minutes, like send that to the president or Kathleen Wynn or somebody, I don't know, send it to somebody. We got the whole meeting on because live I, stream. Because it's like those, those process issues, right? And if the process continues to be flawed, and the process continues to be uh, set up in a way that is intimidating to students and set up in a way that uh, students ha are put in the position of having to negotiate on behalf of administration, on behalf of physical plant director, and on behalf of all these other people uh, who, I don't know what they're paid, but they're paid. You folks aren't, right? Uh, you know, I want to I wanna see at some point administration create a plan to do to change those real serious issues, process issues. Excuse me. I heard again like twice a few times I think you created a great statement which got me thinking was uh certain money was in the month. And uh, we're talking about health and safety and Canada and and how we um well, this might be causing this, causing that to other people and uh, our people here, right? But where's health and safety in Canada when our steel plant's poisoning our waters? Right there. How come our non-proven to Health Canada that this does any type of damage to us, but yet the water we drink has fluoride in it, which is poison? Or the steel plant right there poisoned in the last great place that we have where everybody's going to get cancer anyway. So what's the difference? Where does this, this start and where does this stop with Health Canada? How come our issue is being able to pray, clear our mind, body, and soul, being Chimin Nayam, right? It, this is our issue here and it's always about First Nations when they're poisoning us right there. All the arsenic in the water, yeah? All the arsenic, our First Nations reserves up north, holes in their faces, can't drink, can't eat, can't supply their own sustainable living. I've been doing sustainable living and building and everything for the last, what, 10, 20 years of my life, and not one government agency would help me help any of these reserves. Building them greenhouses, I have 24, seven days a week, greenhouses that run a biomass, and these are jobs, these are, and another young man brought up uh, Mother Nature Medicines. I'm a big part of that, bringing that to First Nations people. But then when I told them there's no taxes because all these uh, greenhouses will be on First Nations land, First Nations business, and then what, they got mad at me because I'm trying to bring this type of uh, non-taxable freedom to our country for our First Nations people. So where does this start and where does it stop with Health Canada? When the poison's right there and then they like, where's, where is the documentation showing that this smudge is, is anyway dangerous to our people. It's going to stop okay. when you give them a glass of their own water. There you go. How about we do that? I'll walk there myself, like my grandfathers did. Great grandfathers, I could go Ching and Ching walk. My grandfathers, I'll go give them a glass of our water right from the steel plant. Let him drink it and see if I he like likes it. That. That. I'd like to see that. Or tribunal, let's go to court and to the Queen's Court, Supreme Court and see what they have to say about us being a sovereign nation. Yeah, but the thing with that is no native lawyer will ever go to the Supreme Court. It doesn't need to be native. It just needs to be No lawyer, no crown lawyer will ever go to the Supreme Court. Wow. Well, then we should make our own courts. Because these poisons are existing in all other areas of our life, but they have a problem with okay, our we'll way of native native living. When we're the first people anyway to be here. Be Thank you. Yeah, That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, so for coming to support us. Um, I think hearing from everybody has been a little bit overwhelming, um, but it's a good overwhelming. Uh, I feel filled with a lot of information from our elders, and I'm very grateful. Um, one second. Um, When you're up against an institution, it can feel very difficult. Um, it seems like everything is built to keep you. Um, 
controlled in, in a sense. So um, these women are very strong, and I, like, I appreciate them standing up here as well, listening. Um, we're up against a very big system, and um, it's been brought down upon us. So um, hearing from everybody has been very helpful. I think we've gotten some clear direction too, like um, with surveys, some ideas um, that we'll take forward as much as we can before the end of the year, and then we'll make sure that the next ASA is well informed. Um, yeah, I would just like to say thank you. <laughs> so don't ever feel intimidated or that they're better than or stronger than or more powerful than. We are all one, equal to, in many different ways, we are giving different gifts. And when we put our, all our gifts together, we're pretty strong. That's true, unless you're the queen and then you got someone white people before you, called the royal stool master. Last night, on your way out, just sign your name to let them know that. Thank you. 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 very much for the work you do. Thank you. 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 I'll give you the web address for this, uh, all right, yeah. and, and I'll put it on YouTube as well. But I'll give you all that info before I go. We're all still right. live. Right. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you. Yar. <laughs> <laughs> Once a week. Once, sorry, once a week on Sunday. Wait, we shake it down. Guaranteed. And if you don't show up to church, then he'll come to your house. It's like, oh, you want me to bless you? Know, and they're very good at it. They've got a lot of practice. 2,000 years of practice. Right now, there's a lot of smudging in the province of Quebec. Government stopped it. Well, for the free, anyway. And I got it all on the live stream. Who's the recording secretary? Were you doing minutes? Are you the recording secretary? No, I'm not. She's yeah. sitting at the back there. Okay, I'll give her all the info as to where this is. Perfect. I got the whole meeting live, and I'll 
transfer it to you too. Yeah. Okay, big watch. Yar. <laughs> I just learned that. Word. I just say like breathing. I had no idea that that was even a thing. You know, I say it so I'm often. So far behind, that I'm going to catch up to myself on the way back around. Uh oh. <laughs> I say it so often that enough people forget my name and they just call me Yar. Yar. Yo ho ho and I'm on the rum. Uh oh. Yo ho ho. 16 men on a float. Excuse me, sir. Thank you. With as much, how you gonna deal? He goes there. Front by the elder. Yeah, the only part of this I couldn't film uh, at the beginning was. Uh, Ceremonial drum and the ceremonial smudge at the beginning only. I will in a sec. And uh, and what is the what's this petition? This isn't a petition. It's a sign in for attending. Okay, I will, and I'll give you the web. You're the recording secretary, so I'll give you where this is. The whole meeting is here. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Miigwech. Thank you. And can I show this? Just to the worldwide audience, just to end this whole, to show them what the discussion yes, was about? Just gonna get the... Okay. And this is what we're talking about, folks. For those that don't know what smudging on Turtle Island is, it's sage and sweetgrass and cedar and tobacco, the four sacred medicines. And if this was smell o vision to the worldwide audience, it smells beautiful. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, folks. My name is Dee Shanger, and uh, thank you for watching and spread the word about this. Uh, thank you, old camera. Uh,